Okay, um, we'll get started here this morning with our webinar. Uh, my name is Charles Gable. I'm the lead PI for the Lake States Fire Science Consortium, uh, funded by the Joint Fire Science Program. Um, we're happy to have you all online this morning uh, to join us for uh, a webinar on web-based fire weather for the Lake States region. Um, our we have three speakers today that will be uh, presenting this information. First is uh, Robert Zeal, who is... Uh, Charles, you seem to be cutting out. Okay. Um, uh, Robert Zeal is our uh, program coordinator for the Lake States Fire uh, Science. Jim and John, can you hear me? We can. I can. Yes. Yes, I hear you, and it doesn't sound as if he's cutting out for me. Okay, um, is that better, Zeke? Uh, yes. Okay, um, so uh, we're fortunate to have Robert Zeal, um, Program Coordinator for the Lake States Fire Science Consortium, um, lead off here today uh, with our webinar. He has uh, 20 years of... Uh, you're cutting out again, uh, Charles. I'm not picking up any of it. Okay, um, I think we're getting some responses from everyone else in the group that uh, the audio is okay um, from the question. Well, I'm, uh, in, uh, Jim and John, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, well, yeah. I'm just going to go ahead and kick this off. Uh, uh, Charles must be having some problems with his uh, uh, audio equipment there. Um, so as uh, Charles began to say, uh, uh, we're doing a... Uh, uh, a webinar today on web-based fire weather for the Lake States. Uh, I'm Robert Zeal. I'm the uh, program coordinator for the Lake States uh, Fire Science Consortium. Uh, John Horrell is a research meteorologist uh, at the University of Utah and is uh, uh, in charge of the Meso West project. Uh, I think most folks are uh, uh, aware of that and have used some of those tools. Uh, the Roman uh, weather source uh, is one that was designed and is uh, uh, maintained by Meso West. And uh, James Barnier is uh, a, a suppression specialist for the Wisconsin DNR. Uh, he, like uh, uh, myself, has been involved in uh, uh, putting weather information, uh, uh, trying to maintain uh, real-time weather information on the web for uh, uh, folks here in the Lake States for several years. And uh, uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, some advances in that. So. Um, Uh, so uh, what I want to mention first um, is uh, uh, that uh, this GoToMeeting uh, technology, uh, you may have used it before, may not. Uh, really, you have this little window uh, control panel on the side that uh, you can uh, move off screen uh, with, by pressing that uh, little orange button. Uh, you have a, a mute button, uh, the green uh, microphone that you can... Uh, uh, I've got it muted for you, all of you uh, today while we're uh, doing the webinar, but if you were to uh, uh, need to speak, uh, you would be able to control your uh, uh, speakers that way. Uh, and finally, if you were displaying things, you would uh, uh, use the uh, blue uh, arrow button, play and pause, as if uh, you were uh, doing something with uh, a DVD or such. Um, now, I know that there's a number of folks that uh, we've been encouraging folks to do this as a group. And so if you are uh, uh, joining as a group, I would urge you in the question box that you have available on your control panel to identify your location uh, and the names of the people that are there with you. That uh, uh, it's uh, uh, going to help us know really how many people we've uh, uh, been able to uh, uh, you know, talk to about this. And certainly, we'll be following up with folks. Uh, and we'd like to include all the people that were in those groups. Um, I, I do want to mention that uh, uh, you know there is integrated audio that comes along with this. Uh, it, it can work well if you have a good, strong uh, internet uh, connection. If it's uh, somewhat variable, it may not work as well. Uh, if you do uh, have a good internet connection, you can use the uh, speakers and a, a microphone if you have one. Uh, but uh, certainly you can use uh, a speakerphone um, or a conference phone 
and uh, uh, we would uh, uh, encourage you in those cases uh, either way to uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, mute um, your uh, uh, your microphone when you're not speaking. Uh, in this case, we've got you all muted, so it's not a real big problem. Uh, take a couple of minutes just to mention a couple of things. Uh, we do have another webinar planned uh, next month, uh, the 7th of April, uh, talking about monitoring burn severity. We have the folks at the uh, uh, monitoring burn severity uh, site uh, uh, at USGS uh, uh, that will be uh, making that presentation, talking about both remote sensing and field techniques. And uh, we hope you take the time to join us uh, on April 7th. Uh, there's registration information on our web page and uh, on uh, uh, the newsletters. Uh, the, uh, uh, we are, uh, uh, just to mention that we are conducting uh, workshops. This is the second one we've done this winter. Uh, and that, uh, you know, as uh, time goes along, if you'd like help with a workshop, uh, uh, certainly contact us to see if we can uh, uh, be participants or perhaps help you, direct you to persons that uh, can help. Um, again, um, uh, please take the time to uh, uh, enter the names of the folks in your group uh, if you're attending uh, as a group uh, so that we capture everybody in addition to the one that uh, signed on. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, uh, start with the webinar. Um, uh, Charles, I don't know, did we uh, come up with any questions at this point? Um, no. Okay. Um, I really have um, uh, four objectives for the webinar uh, that uh, I'm going to take a, a little bit of time here and discuss the background of fire weather and fire danger here in the Lake States uh, and the reasons for uh, the project we're talking about. Uh, and then I'll pass it over to uh, John Horrell, uh, and he will um, uh, talk about uh, Meso West and uh, the Great Lakes uh, Fire and Fuels Project from a technical standpoint. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time. Uh, that will certainly uh, be dependent on uh, how fast we go, but I'll uh, spend a little time talking about navigation and what some of the choices are in the system uh, and some of its features. Uh, and then finally, I'll be turning it over to Jim to talk about some of the agency-specific issues. Uh, uh, you know, anytime you have a cooperative effort, uh, there's always individual choices and, uh, uh, you know, uh, compromises that you make, and uh, he'll talk to that issue a little bit uh, towards the end. Uh, but uh, uh, unless there's uh, any reason not to, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, start with this. Okay. So uh, folks are uh, certainly familiar, uh, many of you, that uh, fire danger rating began uh, many years ago. Uh, the uh, state of Michigan, for example, uh, uh, began using the 72 system. Uh, national, fire, uh, national Fire Danger Rating uh, in the early 70s, uh, and there were many, many manual records collected at almost every field office across the state. I think that Minnesota and Mich Wisconsin had similar histories. Uh, and uh, the um, uh, real big change for us came when we uh, received uh, funding from a variety of sources to uh, uh, purchase uh, remote automated weather stations. Uh, these raw stations uh, replaced most of these manual stations. Uh, the Michigan DNR uh, maintains uh, 12 uh, or 14 of them. Uh, Wisconsin uh, and Minnesota uh, probably both maintain a, a larger number, uh, somewhere in the range of 20. So uh, there's also uh, raw stations that are cooperators, uh, uh, the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, and Park Service uh, maintain across the three states as well. Uh, this map here uh, gives you an idea of what uh, that ROS network looks like uh, at this point. Uh, it's fairly well distributed, but uh, in the lower parts of the three states, you can see there are uh, significant gaps. Um, with the uh, advent of the ROS stations uh, came really um, uh, the opportunity to use associated software. And that uh, all states found that the software that came with these raw stations allowed us to collect the information uh, to um, uh, actually store it and display it in a variety of ways. Uh, and that uh, you can still go to uh, all three state websites and see what that information looks like. That uh, uh, the uh, uh, 
The standalone software uh, was designed in the 90s, um, and um, uh, it, served, it is still serving uh, in many places. Uh, but when you think about it, software that was designed when uh, Windows 95 was the uh, software or the operating system of choice um, is becoming long in the tooth. Uh, and um, the uh, uh, manufacturer of the software hasn't maintained it uh, in at least uh, four years. Uh, they uh, uh, don't intend to uh, maintain it in the future, and so we really began to need to look for other choices. Uh, when we looked at this. Uh, the three states are part of uh, the Great Lakes Forest Fire Compact, and that uh, they're always uh, considering what issues they have in common and what opportunities they share to uh, solve their problems. Uh, and um, the opportunity arose to uh, look for funding and to pursue an effort to modernize the way we collect, manage, and display fire weather information. Uh, we obtained a, a, a Forest Service redesign grant from the Eastern Region, and uh, we're using those funds along with uh, uh, state funds and services to uh, work with Meso West to uh, uh, um, build this Great Lakes Fire and Fuel Site. Uh, I, I think that uh, it is important um, to uh, uh, recognize that um, choice of Meso West was not accidental or uh, uh, them in any way, is that uh, I think we all uh, have looked at Roman and seen what all kinds of information there is in there, and certainly the notion that we can use information uh, that uh, is beyond our RAWS network uh, was uh, a real meaningful opportunity that Meso West brought to us. They have also, they provide certainly a uh, familiar interface, uh, but this information and the skills uh, and technical understanding that they have uh, has really made this uh, project possible. Um, so really, that's that's what we're talking about uh, today, is uh, this Great Lakes Fire Fuel Site. Um, you can see the uh, uh, the web address here. Uh, it's uh, glffc.utah.edu. Uh, it's based on MesoWest technology and resources. Uh, it went uh, operational as of uh, March 1st. Uh, and that uh, uh, although we uh, uh, this is really the, the rollout season, and so uh, we have it built so that we'll be reviewing it through the year, uh, and that uh, development will be completed by October 1st. That doesn't mean that uh, the project will be finished, uh, that uh, a lot of the things that we're doing here uh, are uh, being tried for the first time, uh, using information in ways that it hasn't been used before. And so uh, uh, we're going to learn as we go uh, with this. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, really our opportunity to show you what we've been working on and uh, uh, where we see it going in the future. So um, uh, I guess, Charles, um, I will ask at this point if there are any questions that uh, we should address. Um, I don't have any that have been posed by the group here this morning at okay. this time. Well, I'm going to uh, then uh, probably pass it over to uh, John. And uh, John, just tell me when you want me to advance the slide. OK. Well, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this. And you know, just to give you a little bit of history, here at the University of Utah, we've been working with the National Weather Service and, and the land agencies uh, dealing with how to get access to the you know, weather information all over the country. And it, it's just kind of filling the need of being able to bring all the data from a variety of different resources and, and make them available for both you know, operational use, research use here uh, at the university and other places, as well as uh, access for the public. And this has been, go ahead and advance uh, Zeke through the rest of uh, these points here. And so Roman. Uh, Roman really um, it has been sort of the front end for a lot of the fire weather applications, and it actually is is undergoing sort of a refresh right now, where the software right now exists down at Western Region of the National Weather Service. It's in the process of moving to some uh, uh, facilities in Kansas City. So now go ahead and go to the next slide. So 
the one thing to recognize with MesaWest is is really it's a, a relational database, and and we uh, as we collect the information, we archive it. Uh, we do some really rudimentary quality control. It's not the best in terms of, of quality control. It's just kind of identifying super uh, bad observations. For the purposes of the Great Lakes Project, the focus is primarily on the raw stations and then as well integrating in the National Weather Service uh, observations that are primarily at airports in cooperation with the FAA. And then in Michigan, using what used to be the MON uh, agro network and now is uh, recast uh, as Enviro weather. So the kinds of, you take all that, those observations and what the National Center for Environmental Prediction, which is part of the Weather Service, there's a lot of need in the Weather Service and, and a variety of other uh, agencies for gridded analyses, where you take all the observations, they're scattered in space, and how do you get those onto a, a high resolution on the order of five kilometer grid? So this real-time mesoscale analysis is a, is a tool out there that takes sort of a first guess from a model forecast, scaled down to five kilometers, and then it uh, incorporates all the observations that are available in real time. And that does introduce some problems because some of the RAWS data won't make it into uh, the RTMA if there's some latencies in the uh, access to the data. So you bring all that in and you get an analysis. Now, as well, the Office of Hydrology creates a uh, multi-sensor precipitation grid which incorporates um, the actual gauge data with radar estimates. And uh, so that's another resource that gets blended into all of this. So those are kind of the observational assets. So, and uh, as we then uh, take advantage of the forecast products that the National Weather Service creates, uh, Zeke, does that forecast one fill in there? No, it's not showing. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, I'll just walk through it. I mean, basically, the the each forecast office uh, in the National Weather Service creates. Uh, gridded products from three hours out to seven days. And uh, because of the, of the uh, way that they generate those grids, especially in terms of quantitative precipitation forecast, we have the capability to be able to use the uh, forecast grids that are a blend of sort of model forecast plus actual eyeballs uh, by the National Weather Service forecasters to adjust those grids with time. And uh, so we use those out for the next two days. And the reason why we're limited out to that range is that's the length of time that they provide a quantitative precipitation forecast. Um, now to talk a little bit about some of the issues as far as how to use this, is this graphic, is this going to fill in, Zeke, or, okay. so. The one thing to be able to recognize is that each network has its kind of its own uh, standards. And so the Weather Service standards for reporting data are different than uh, the land agency uh, RAWS standards. So, and the equipment is different in the sense that most uh, aviation equipment is mounted on, on uh, 30 foot towers as opposed to RAWS that are 20 foot. The time interval that the observations are made tend to be, well, are required to be a shorter duration for the National Weather Service than a 10-minute average for the RAWS observations. So what that tends to do is, is that the Weather Service observations will tend especially to have higher wind speeds than uh, a RAWS if you were to co-locate those two. And then that also translates in, in terms of the model forecast uh, that the Weather Service starts from and then adjusts, there's the tendency for the forecast to actually be uh, higher as well. And so that, right now, we're, we're bringing in the, the wind information uh, into the uh, fire danger rating codes, and we're, we're diminishing them a little bit, but we don't have a whole lot of feel yet for how to adjust that, and that's something 
will do over time as well. The other thing to be aware of in terms of both the, the gridded precipitation estimates in terms of what's actually happened are uh, you know, really dependent on where the gauges are uh, and you know, what the coverage is of the, uh, of the radar. So you'll, you'll have gaps. There'll be places that'll miss. And then, especially as far as the forecast products, the, the uh, grids are going to be dependent. And you'll see artificial boundaries uh, between adjacent National Weather Service uh, forecast areas. So they each have their own county warning area. And you may see some sharp boundaries in, uh, in some code products as a result of these differences in precipitation. So I think, and you can go ahead and go to the next one. Uh, and again, this just kind of shows, um, even though within sort of you can go into the MesoWest mode uh, and look at things nationally, the real the focus here is you know is on the Michigan, Wisconsin, and uh, Minnesota domain, and uh, so that it uh, keeps this fairly manageable. And then go to the next one. Um, now, Zeke, were you going to go through these, or did you want me to? Uh, well, I can go through them if you'd like. Uh, that. Uh, uh, yeah. So. Uh, uh, yeah. Why don't you? So then you can walk through them a little easier. Uh, so what we've designed in the system is that uh, uh, for the uh, stations that uh, we decide to uh, conduct calculations on, uh, and there are a number of the. Uh, National Weather Service stations that do not collect rainfall, so we don't include those. Um, uh, there are others where the uh, uh, data is suspect, uh, and so uh, we have control of which ones uh, are calculated. Uh, the, uh, uh, each of those stations where the decision is to uh, make calculations, that uh, Canadian Forest Fire Danger Rating System daily uh, uh, standard values are calculated for all fire weather index uh, codes and indices. Uh, basically at midday for both the current and the next uh, two days. Uh, in addition to those daily standard calculations that uh, the system is designed to produce hourly calculations of those uh, codes that change uh, based on uh, uh, fast changing uh, weather conditions like wind. Uh, and you'll see that uh, the fine fuel moisture code, the initial spread index, and fire weather index all uh, uh, have hourly values that will be uh, displayed in the system. Uh, with respect to the National Fire Danger Rating System, that uh, the system will collect and display daily uh, NIFTRS indices and point forecasts, uh, but only for those raw stations that report uh, uh, to WIMS. The information is coming from WIMS, uh, and all we're doing is displaying that information uh, uh, in behalf of the users. Uh, so. Uh, uh, with uh, respect to the gridded overlays, uh, that uh, we will uh, do daily estimates of the uh, actual uh, observed, uh, if you will, weather conditions for each uh, five kilometer grid cell. And John, uh, I'll go ahead and mention that there is uh, 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 the notion that we will actually be uh, surfacing two and a half kilometer grid cells in the future. Uh, that uh, in addition to that uh, estimate for today, uh, that there are two days of forecasted conditions that we'll be uh, uh, employing for each five kilometer grid cell uh, as well. Uh, ag again, um, it's only the daily standard values that we're not uh, making any effort to calculate hourly values uh, from these uh, gridded weather elements. Uh, and that uh, it's important to uh, recognize that those daily values are intended as uh, the peak of the day conditions. Um, seek a couple questions. Um, First is, um, what time is considered midday for those calculations? Uh, we're using, uh, uh, for the entire Lake States, we're using uh, 1800 UTC. Uh, that translates to uh, uh, 1400 Eastern Daylight Time uh, or 1300 Central Daylight Time. Uh, and uh, the system will display um, the, uh, uh, I've got to put up my PowerPoint again. Um, Um, the uh, um, the system uh, 
uh, we'll, dis we'll display the actual time locally, uh, but uh, it's important to recognize that uh, we decided uh, based on sun angle and the uh, situation in each of the three states that the 1800 UTC made the most sense. Um, okay. Okay. And then another question, um, you mentioned that uh, um, there's some control aspect over the um, stations that you include um, in your calculations. So does the control over those stations change over time? So for instance, um, are, is there some monitoring of whether those are out, those measurements are outside of some normal range of conditions, um, and then once they may get back into, say, a couple of days later into um, a more, quote unquote, normal range of conditions, or at least ones that aren't, wouldn't be flagged, are those included back into the calculations? Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Uh, well, actually, what uh, uh, goes on in this case is uh, that uh, uh, we, uh, 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 we do use the MesoWest uh, system for uh, monitoring uh, uh, the quality of the data, and it does display that. I, I think that on one of the earlier slides, there, was, uh, there were several of the dots that uh, displayed yellow conditions. Uh, but those uh, are just course uh, uh, evaluations. Uh, we're also uh, uh, monitoring the, uh, uh, the codes themselves, the uh, Canadian codes themselves. Uh, uh, oftentimes are the, some of the best indicators of where rainfall has, uh, uh, is uh, not uh, being collected properly uh, or a wind gauge may be broken. And so you'll see that the, uh, the conditions are uh, aberrant when compared to stations around them. So uh, there's a, a variety of ways that, can, that data can be uh, managed. And if we see a station that uh, needs repair, we can turn off uh, the calculations. Uh, and um, uh, if there's a, a missing piece of data that needs to be added, that can be added and uh, calculations carry forward. Okay. And then one more question. Um, is access to these systems equal for non-governmental organizations? Uh, the website is public. Uh, in, uh, uh, anyone can request a, a, a login, uh, but you don't need it. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more so that uh, public, private uh, uh, have equal access to the information. Okay, great. Um, so really when we talk about uh, the weather system itself, uh, certainly provides a great deal of information. But what we're really uh, doing with this system is recognizing that uh, fire managers need to make a situation assessment each day in each incident, uh, each situation. And really they're looking at things like the risk of spread and fire intensity, uh, the potential smoke production, uh, things like holdover fire potential and fire effects themselves, uh, whether you're talking about prescribed burning uh, or wildfire uh, uh, readiness uh, or actually uh, uh, an attack response, uh, all these things are important considerations. Uh, I'm going to uh, highlight the uh, National Weather Service's fire website uh, just for a minute to uh, identify the value it brings. Uh, it provides, provides localized access to current weather conditions. Uh, localized access to the uh, forecast products that they prepare, uh, and also uh, uh, valid links uh, that uh, are maintained to all the climate prediction uh, products and outlook pro uh, information. The Great Lakes Fire Fuel site, you'll see that we are offering expanded access to these uh, forecast products, uh, and uh, the grids will give us actually more detailed and distributed estimates of fuel moisture and flammability uh, as you uh, uh, consider fire danger and fire behavior potential. So um, uh, let's uh, uh, look at this uh, uh, weather.gov slash fire site. Uh, I, I hope folks have uh, been redirected to this. Uh, it's uh, their effort uh, at providing as much fire weather information for folks as they, uh, they can. Um, uh, it says experimental uh, on the site when you uh, bring it up, but uh, uh, I've been assured by uh, Larry Van Bussum that, in fact, it is uh, their operational site. The site it replaced uh, is no longer operational, and that uh, although it is on an, uh, a, uh, uh, a server that is still uh, being uh, uh, tested, uh, that the site is as it's going to be moving forward, and it is operational for all intents and purposes. 
Uh, I will point out this uh, comprehensive set of National Weather Service links and information um, that uh, you can see if you're looking at the whole country where things like uh, red flag warnings and uh, fire weather watches are. Uh, and then, you know, uh, if you look around, you'll see down at the bottom there are uh, accesses to other products you could overlay, uh, as well as other uh, uh, separate products. I think one of the most valuable features of this site, though, is that it allows you to zero in on a particular area. You can zoom by uh, a name of a town. You could zoom by a lat long of a fire location. You could uh, uh, zoom by any of those features uh, identified there on the right. Uh, and when you uh, uh, select that, it, it marks that location and finds the most local instance of the various uh, forecast products uh, and reference uh, weather information for that location. Uh, it's a pretty powerful tool to pull in what you need uh, on a quick basis. Uh, so it, it really is a, a, a pretty powerful way to grab uh, weather forecast and uh, current condition information quickly. Uh, so this site is probably something you should maintain. Everyone's familiar with the uh, fire weather planning forecast. You'll, uh, when you bring it up this way, you get the local uh, fire weather zone forecast. Uh, uh, the, one of the other things that this uh, national digital forecast database provides, of course, is um, hour by hour forecasts. Uh, and this will allow you to surface that for that particular uh, grid cell uh, over a two-day period of time. Uh, this provides you uh, access to the local spot forecast request, uh, which is a, a pretty important uh, uh, access. Uh, and then finally, also, one of the other products that many folks use is this uh, weather planner, where you can enter criteria uh, that might match your, your prescription criteria and see where you have those kinds of conditions uh, during the forecast period. So this uh, national digital forecast database uh, is really a very versatile tool uh, and uh, it's made available to uh, a variety of products uh, in a variety of ways. Um, so, uh, and, and Charles, I'll just pause for a moment here as uh, we wait for the screen to uh, resurface. Is there uh, anything I, I should answer about the uh, Weather Service site? I don't think so, not at this time. Okay. Well, what you're looking at now is the uh, uh, welcome screen. Uh, to the Great Lakes Fire Fuel site. Again, the website uh, is a fairly simple one to remember. Uh, and um, uh, it's available to uh, everyone, public and private, as well. Uh, you'll notice uh, there's a login uh, site there and the ability to create uh, a user. We'll talk about that a little bit more, why you might consider doing that. But it is not required. Um, you'll notice on this page is uh, there are some uh, uh, specific access to uh, various uh, uh, databases, uh, and that uh, this probably gives you access to uh, the widest assortment of data, uh, you know, for any particular station. Um, the um, uh, the links here on the left are designed to make it easy for you to start from this site and move to others. You'll notice that National Weather Service Fire Weather site is linked here. Uh, the three state sites are linked there. Uh, and also, there is a contact uh, for each of the three states if, in fact, uh, you need to contact them with questions or uh, uh, considerations. Um, you'll notice at the center of the page that PDF is uh, uh, information that's very much like what we're talking about on the webinar. You can go there to uh, uh, you know, download that file and uh, maintain it as a reference uh, at your desk as you use the site. And finally, the way you get into the system uh, further is to actually just click on the map that shows on this screen. Uh, you know, we uh, uh, didn't design a, a very uh, uh, blitzy site. It was really designed mostly to be functional for folks uh, so that it will come up quickly and uh, provide them the information they need readily. And so if you uh, log in from this website, the only way you, the way you get to the map page is just simply to click on the, uh, the map on the screen. Uh, once you click on that map, um, it brings up uh, the map screen uh, that you see here. You can certainly uh, link to this address directly. Uh, it's uh, a little bit longer and maybe not something you would remember, but you certainly can favorite it uh, once you get here and uh, start from this point. You'll notice that the agency links are here as well. And um, uh, we can... Uh, uh, 
uh, we can provide uh, uh, the same links to the National Weather Service site from this page uh, as well. So uh, uh, this is probably the uh, uh, place that uh, you will uh, go first uh, to actually begin using the system. Uh, the map screen is based on the Google Map environment, uh, very much like uh, working with Google Earth. Uh, and uh, you have zoom controls on the upper left. Uh, that it provides a number of different overlays that you can uh, uh, put on the map. And uh, again, you can uh, log in from this screen uh, directly as well. So let's uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, the Canadian system. Uh, certainly, it's the uh, system that we have uh, emphasized with this uh, development of this site. The uh, Fire Weather Index uh, system uh, really is a very simple system. It requires only four weather elements at that uh, midday uh, time of observation. Uh, if you collect hourly data, you can make hourly calculations. But uh, for the purposes of things like the grids, uh, that daily observation uh, only requires four weather elements, temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, and rainfall. Now, the reasons for the uh, 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 when you use a system like this, it may not always uh, respond in ways that you agree with. But it's very easy to see what causes the changes in the codes or the indices. When it rains, the codes go down. Uh, when it's windy, the codes go up. Uh, it's very clear how weather relates to the outputs of the system. That really, there's fewer options in the calculations of the code which makes it uh, much easier to facilitate grid calculations. The numbers are the numbers. Uh, and uh, the, the formulas that uh, produce those numbers don't have a lot of user inputs on a day-to-day -day basis. And finally, I guess I would say that the reason that uh, folks uh, here in the uh, upper Midwest took an interest in it is this intermediate moisture code, uh, that it really seems to capture the summer seasonality and fire potential. Um, you know, I, I debated on whether to uh, uh, cover this. Uh, I certainly uh, think that uh, uh, we can uh, have a, a session about this at another time. But I wanted to point out that uh, really the heart of the Canadian system is its fuel moisture codes. Uh, that it's nothing more than an accounting system. The values go up when it's hot and dry. They go down when it rains. Uh, and there's really three moisture codes uh, that uh, they're capturing as a part of that system. The fine fuel moisture code represents the surface fuels, uh, litter, grasses, those kinds of fine fuels. And they've designed it uh, because you know the, the uh, northern conditions are uh, largely forested uh, as a little longer fuel. It's uh, like a 16-hour fuel in their own terms. The Duff moisture code, as I mentioned, is a, a powerful piece of information uh, that represents, uh, in their terms, moisture in the upper organic layer. Uh, but I think uh, you know, given that it's like a 300-hour time lag, uh, it really uh, has potential. And once you get to follow it, uh, you understand that it really does relate uh, to uh, conditions in live fuels here in the Lake States. Uh, that that's really uh, that 300-hour or that 12-day uh, uh, time lag is uh, uh, really significantly different than uh, any of the uh, uh, values produced uh, in the American system. And uh, I think it uh, bears merit. Uh, and finally, the drought code uh, is uh, like uh, Keech Byram, very much uh, uh, responds in uh, very much like the Keech Byram system does. Um, but it is uh, uh, identified sort of as a 50-day uh, time lag. And um, uh, it requires uh, uh, adjustment, uh, perhaps, at the spring of the year based on how much precipitation you had over the winter. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, perhaps a very good indication of holdover fire potential, ground fire, uh, mop-up problems, those kinds of things. So um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot more time on that. Uh, if there's questions or time at the end, Charles, uh, I'd, I'd say that uh, we could talk about that more. But at this point in time, I think it's more important that we talk about the technology and the, the opportunities of uh, accessing the information. Sure. Um, the, um, uh, so what I think one of the real uh, beauties of the system is, is when you have all these weather stations, you have all this information for all these different codes and indices, 
it can become daunting to try and make sense of it. Uh, and so one of the things we did is we put some time into recognizing uh, local thresholds and then figuring out ways to display them. So uh, we started out with uh, this uh, set of Ontario thresholds for the six codes and indices uh, that uh, break into five classes, which is pretty typical of danger rating. Um, and they form the uh, basis of uh, uh, what we built in the um, uh, Great Lakes Fire and Fuel site. Uh, just as an example, uh, the Michigan DNR produced an adjective class um, a five-class system uh, that used a combination of codes and indices. Now, in this system, not all of the indices have five classes, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it's designed to uh, recognize uh, important thresholds. Uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin have developed similar classifications, uh, and the point I'm making here is, is that we looked at these kinds of thresholds as we built the uh, uh, the criteria into the Great Lakes Fire and Fuel. Um, the, uh, the result uh, of uh, all looking at these thresholds was that we really wanted to do more than produce just five colors. That uh, a lot of times it's important to know whether you're moving into a class or out of a class, uh, to know whether you're on the high end or the low end. And so what we did is within each of these five classes, we developed three bands of uh, like colors that allow you to look at this map and sort of see what the trends are across, uh, uh, spatially, looking uh, uh, across boundaries and uh, uh, trying to get an idea of how conditions are changing uh, in the geography. That, um, uh, so that's what you're looking at. Uh, when you uh, look at uh, the map page and you have the grids displayed uh, or you have Canadian codes displayed, uh, you're looking at these color codes that uh, have been developed for the site. Uh, you can see there's a, a good deal, deal of detail uh, with that. And uh, zoomed out like this, it just, again, still seems like uh, an awful lot of information. Uh, I will point out that uh, there are several features here uh, that you have the ability to select the data uh, and display the way you want it. Uh, you have the ability to uh, actually go back and look at history. Uh, both uh, uh, our intent is to maintain these grids uh, on a history basis as well as the, the station data. Uh, and then again, uh, I mentioned the links that we talked about before. Um, the, uh, uh, data selection, I will point out that, uh, that the network uh, includes uh, uh, three kinds of stations. Uh, the raw stations you can display separately. The National Weather Service you can display separately. Uh, or you can show all the stations at once, which was uh, what we showed on that last screen. Um, the, the map mode uh, identifies the type of data, whether it's Canadian. National Fire Danger Rating, or just Meso West to show the most weather information. Now, in the Canadian uh, uh, or the NIFTERS display, there is no wind direction available. And so if you want to look at the wind barbs to get wind direction information, you'll have to switch to the Meso West. Uh, the station value itself allows you to select any weather element, uh, any of the, uh, the codes or indices for the specific uh, system that you map mode that you've selected. Uh, and there are a number of choices, including forecast as well as actual uh, or current conditions. The grid layers is uh, an important feature because it allows you to show uh, the map without the grid behind it, uh, giving you more uh, clear view of the ge geography, uh, the map information that's displayed. You can display the image itself. Uh, and the third choice allows you to display the image and as you mouse around the screen, it shows you the value for the grid cell that you're over. Uh, and so that uh, is a, an important uh, piece of information to uh, allow you to uh, uh, see how things are changing across a particular color uh, or area. Now, the, uh, the daytime is uh, uh, maybe something that will take a little bit of practice to get used to. Sometimes there are three values, and sometimes there are four. But uh, uh, really, the first value is always the most recent actual conditions. Uh, so uh, I may have been looking at this at 11 o'clock in the morning. 
And so the last actual conditions are uh, actually at 10 o'clock yesterday or on the day before. Uh, the second one, if in fact uh, you're looking at one of the, ch the codes that changes hourly, allows you to uh, surface, uh, at least for the stations, the current conditions for weather elements and for the, uh, uh, the conditions that change hourly, the fine fuel moisture code, the initial spread index, and the uh, fire weather index. And then you'll also see that there are forecast values for two subsequent days that you can display the grid and the uh, weather station information for. So it allows you to switch back and forth between these very quickly. Uh, the system is very uh, impressively uh, powerful in its ability to uh, uh, move quickly from feature to feature. And uh, uh, I uh, certainly encourage you to take a look at uh, how it works. The, uh, the radius, uh, one of the things that when you look at, for example, it shows here 300 miles. If you're looking at um, uh, stations over a 300-mile radius, you're looking at almost all the stations that we're calculating codes for, for example, or all the stations that Meso West is monitoring. Uh, and so that can slow the system down. Uh, what I would encourage you to do is to um, uh, seriously consider reducing this to the area that you're truly interested in, uh, perhaps a 50-mile radius around a prescribed burn. Uh, or a 100-mile radius around uh, an area that you're managing, uh, that sort of thing. Um, that, uh, uh, I will mention that you can um, search, use the search button above, uh, and uh, actually enter a lat long city uh, zip code. Uh, and then, uh, or you can even click on the map, and it will select the stations uh, uh, within that radius. Uh, you have the ability to show a table of data instead of the map which uh, uh, will give you a good picture of an individual station uh, very quickly and a combination of those based on your radius selection. The time option is uh, uh, another uh, uh, powerful feature uh, that, uh, as I mentioned, there's quite a bit of history built into this. Uh, some, some of the raw stations uh, uh, that began as manual stations have data going back into the 70s. And so it is possible to surface that information uh, for at least uh, stations that have that data. Uh, and so uh, you can uh, click auto uh, current time on to display the current day. You can turn it off and enter a particular date. Um, now, there, at this point in time, there are grids for 2009 that uh, we were uh, using for demonstration purposes. Uh, our intention is to maintain a uh, history of these things going forward. And so uh, you'll be able to go back and look at things uh, earlier this year uh, when you uh, get into the fire season and uh, evaluate those grids as well as the station data on those days. And, and finally, uh, once you get to an area you're interested in, it is possible to very quickly uh, move from day to day forward and backwards with those previous and next day buttons. Uh, so, uh, again, you have a lot of control over uh, information that exists in the system and that for, uh, uh, for us, we're looking to this to be sort of our uh, archive of uh, uh, codes and indices. Now, if you um, um, uh, have the map view up and you just want to look at a, a particular station, you can mouse over it and it brings up this uh, uh, box of information that shows the current conditions and the latest daily uh, uh, values uh, for the uh, Canadian codes. Uh, if you're in the Canadian mode, uh, it'll do the same in NIFTRS mode. Um, you, if you click on that button or on that point, it will bring up a dialog box that uh, allows you several standard graphs. Uh, you can see them across the uh, top there. You can look at temperature and humidity. You can look at wind, precipitation. Uh, fine fuel moisture code, FWIS, ISI are all hourly values, like the graph you're seeing here. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the final four there are uh, uh, only daily values, and so we're displaying those over a longer period of time. If you look below that, you can see a summary of the three uh, periods, the current and the two forecast periods. Uh, and below that, there are some links to give you even more uh, access to information uh, that uh, is available there. Uh, so uh, if you were to click on the year to date CFFDRS, uh, it, it brings up um, a, a table of data. 
Uh, and basically what it is is for a given year, uh, it displays uh, all of the daily codes and indices. Uh, that it includes, uh, with that uh, table of uh, year-to-date data, it includes two days of forecasted codes and indices. Uh, and the, the, the interesting part of this is, is that as the NDFD grids are updated, um, these uh, forecasts are updated as well four times a day. Uh, what they are doing is going back and at these uh, grid cell locations, uh, collecting what rainfall has actually been collected uh, and updating the forecast to just a shortened period. And so uh, the next forecast period is uh, updated with actual rainfall that has fallen uh, through part of the day. Um, and um, the other thing to note here is that uh, uh, the uh, dates uh, where you have current information, uh, if they're highlighted in blue, you can click on them and bring up hourly conditions uh, so you can look at uh, how things uh, were uh, uh, changing from hour to hour. Um, Zeke, can I ask a couple questions here? Sure. Um, so I guess the first one is when you have your network set to the Canadian system, the CFFDRS, um, why do not all the raw stations also show on the map? Uh, at this point in time, they're not all started up. Uh, it's still uh, winter time in many places, and so uh, uh, the, the stations that have been started up in uh, northern Wisconsin uh, were done for testing purposes. We're evaluating just how much they change during the winter because uh, we think it's possible that uh, they can be operated throughout the winter. Uh, at this point in time, uh, They've been operating for uh, a couple of months, and the drop codes really have not climbed at all. Uh, that uh, the ones in southern Michigan have been started because they actually are in uh, burning conditions, and I think that uh, across the uh, other two states, we'll see those things starting up uh, relatively soon as well. Okay. Uh, the, we have the ability to edit those uh, based on location. Okay. Um, and then, when you look at historical data that you can download from the uh, Mesa West site here. Um, are those the actual conditions, or what was for the forecast was for those dates, historically? It, it really depends on uh, what it is you're asking for. That uh, If you're in the current year, uh, and you're at the current day, uh, and you ask for the forecast period, it will display forecasted uh, grids and uh, station codes. If you're looking back at history, uh, like last year, um, the, and that uh, uh, subsequent days will be uh, uh, actual values. So uh, really, it is in context to when you're looking. OK, so it's not possible to look in the past, say, from last year, and actually get the predicted information or forecasted information for that date. It will only provide the actual data. Uh, you can actually download forecast information from last year. Okay. Uh, uh, that uh, the download feature allows that. Okay. And then um, finally, what time specifically is the um, NWS forecast info um, ingested or included? Uh, that uh, we're collecting that sometime right around midday. Uh, I think uh, uh, John, can you speak to that? Yes. So there done four times a day the uh, forecasts are updated, but the critical one is the one uh, at 1230 Central Daylight Time, and then basically six hours after that. Oh, 130 now. 130 Central Daylight Time, and then every six hours staggered from there. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah. And so a follow-up. Yeah, so a follow-up to the um, historical um, question. So if you're looking back a few weeks ago, um, will I be getting actual data or the forecasted data? And so I'm guessing you can actually um, specify that as an option when you do your query. Is that correct? I think the only way you can look at forecast data from the past is by downloading it uh, from the download links. Okay, so if you are looking back from for a few weeks ago, you will be getting the actual data for, that was recorded. That that's my understanding. Yes. Okay, um, and then finally, 
can you request a station to be started if um, individuals want to get data from it now? Uh, uh, you can, and the, those contacts are uh, going to be listed at the end. There's one for each state. Okay, great. Um, so, um, uh, again, uh, I just want to point out, if you click on that year-to-date uh, CFFDRS, uh, you'll see that there are a number of links here. You can uh, click on the, the map information to see where the station is located. Of course, uh, many of us have heard uh, the quality of those locations, uh, and so uh, you always have to take that uh, uh, carefully and cautiously. Um, that uh, the, uh, as I mentioned before, you have the ability to change years here and go back and look in the past. Uh, you have the ability, as we've been talking about, to download CFFDRS data for a particular station. Uh, and you also have the ability to uh, customize graphs uh, uh, here. You can change to graphical display and have access to a variety of graphs. Um, the, um, uh, I, I will mention that uh, we are surfacing fire danger uh, classes for both uh, uh, the Canadian and uh, National Fire Danger Rating Systems, uh, and Jim Barnier will talk about that a little bit more. Um, and so I, I only have a couple of slides here to talk about uh, the uh, uh, NIFTRS and MESO West modes, uh, because we put much less effort into developing information here, uh, but certainly you have access uh, to information, and the MESO West mode provides you access to all of the weather data that's being collected by uh, a particular uh, station location. Um, in the NFDRS map mode, uh, that really it's only available, it's only going to show stations that are maintained in winds. In other words, if you're not going in and changing uh, the uh, uh, R's to O's, as everyone's, uh, a number of folks uh, have probably had experience doing that, if you're not doing that, those stations will not show up uh, in uh, NFDRS mode. And uh, for example, the Michigan DNR raw stations uh, are not being maintained in WIMS, and so they will not be displayed in NFDRS mode. Um, that uh, uh, the uh, uh, it, it does include the full set of codes and indices, as you'll see on the left there. You have access to uh, all of the codes and indices in the NIFTR station, but it's important to recognize that how the station was set up uh, is how. Uh, it will display this information, that we're only collecting these codes and indices for the first fuel model defined in the WIMS station catalog. You will be able to see which, whether, or which uh, uh, fuel model that is when you display the data, but uh, it will vary from station to station unless there is a concerted effort uh, like there has been in Wisconsin to uh, change those to uh, a particular fuel model. Uh, and that the other thing is, is it will display forecasts, but it will only display forecasts for those that are posted to WIMS, that the National Weather Service actually uh, takes the uh, observations posted in WIMS and uh, makes what they call point forecasts that they post to WIMS, and that uh, we will surface those for those stations that that effort has been made. Um, I will speak just a couple of minutes about uh, as a West map mode that, uh, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of information in here. It's really the weather site. Uh, you have additional information, things like the uh, dew point, uh, things like solar radiation. Those kinds of things uh, can be surfaced uh, in Meso West map mode. So you may be changing back and forth uh, from time to time. And importantly, wind direction uh, is only displayed uh, in Meso West map mode uh, in this system. So should you create a user? Um, I, I, uh, I think that uh, if you want to uh, bring up the system and bring it up uh, in the way you want to see it each time, in other words, if you are working in the eastern part of the Upper Peninsula or you're up in the arrowhead of uh, uh, northern Minnesota, if you are interested really only in the weather stations in that area uh, and you want to zoom into that area and select the radius that only uh, uh, includes those stations, you can actually define a profile uh, and uh, make that your default profile so that when you log in and uh, uh, go to the map page, uh, it will bring it up in that way every time. So there is a value in doing that. Uh, 
but uh, uh, really uh, the other thing that you get out of that is that if you uh, uh, want to access, uh, say, download a year's worth of data for a particular station, the only way you're going to be able to do that is by creating a user uh, profile and uh, logging in uh, when you want to do that. So there's two important reasons to consider uh, getting a login. Of course, you need to manage a password. It doesn't have to change, but you have to remember it. Uh, and um, uh, you may or may not want to do that. It's there as an option, but purely is an option. So with that, uh, I don't know if there's any questions that came up, Charles, uh, as I was talking, but I'm about ready to turn it over to Jim Barnier to talk yeah. about uh, agency-specific issues. Sure. So um, there is one question that's come through. Um, is there any way to get information um, at a specific site about snow cover? Uh, not from our site. OK. That was a short one. All right. All right. Well, um, uh, Jim, I'll uh, advance the slide when you tell me to. OK. Uh, welcome, everyone. And I guess my, my uh, effort here you may is. Maybe muted, Jim. No, he, he's good. I can hear him at least. My effort here was to uh, look at and develop some, some uh, fire danger rating perspectives as it's related to uh, different field types that uh, exist in the Great Lakes area. And, you know, as Zeke had already mentioned that, uh, you know, clearly there's going to be some differences between Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota. And between those issues, really what we're trying to achieve was to develop a difference in, in perspective as it related to conifer fuel types, grass, and hardwoods. Um, Zeke um, in Michigan took some great efforts of developing some basic standards that they used in Michigan for uh, conifer types and uh, broke those out into both spring, summer, and fall conditions. Uh, here in Wisconsin, uh, we took those same uh, components and looked at those and developed basically uh, a differing breakpoints as it related to uh, conifer, grass, and hardwoods. Um, and, and when we look at uh, fuels and, and fire danger as it relates to the Great Lakes, uh, some of those components are related to uh, or have strong perspectives as it relates to fine fuel moisture code, ISI, and BUI um, when it comes to summertime conditions. Uh, we, we recognize our springtime conditions are uh, light, uh, wind-driven, light fuels, wind-driven type fires, and that, that has the biggest influence. Um, from a, a fire danger perspective to the public and for fire managers to recognize when those conditions, um, you know, they need to advise the public on what the conditions may exist. Now this is a good reference point for fire managers throughout the um, Great Lakes to make their determination what they still set. This is, these are weather driven type fire dangers. Uh, components and what it does is it allows them then to set their standards or their danger level um, taking these into consideration. Um, these do not set the fire danger per each individual agency standards. Um, we looked at trying to develop a, a standard across the Great Lakes and, um, and when you work with different agencies you recognize there's uh, you know, different components that each agency wants to be added into there and so we didn't we couldn't come to some conclusion on what one one size fit all shall we say so what we did was we recognized both Minnesota or excuse me Michigan and Wisconsin had similar components of and and were acceptance of those as it relates to the conifer perspective and so what you see surfacing now on the map is uh, basically the conifer fuel danger springtime breakpoints that would be established. And, and those are, um, they'll be surfaced in here. Um, they're not on here yet, but so you can understand what the, how they were developed and uh, generated. But um, those items are basically the same standards uh, for conifer, grass, and hardwoods during the springtime component. As we recognize, um, it's light fuels, uh, you know, the wind 
wind uh, coefficient as it relates to hardwoods isn't affected um, substantially due to you know leaf off components. So the standard class fit, fit across all three types. The difference you see is you'll see is in the uh, summertime uh, breakpoints where we took those in, those items, those different wind wind uh, 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 coefficient components into consideration and looked over a long histor historical perspective as it relates to uh, these danger rating levels that exist out here. Um, and, and, and when you speak to Minnesota, we didn't want to provide, you'll see a NA or um, uh, not applicable to Minnesota's, you know, so they don't see the same component, just so there is not that, because my understanding, uh, one of the things that uh, was developed there was they used a different uh, set of criteria largely RH and ISI for their development of their uh, fire danger perspective as it related to sifters. So those being said that there is a bit of a difference amongst and between the states um, overall. But the, the component here is that it's just servicing um, some perspective of what the condition would exist as it relates to fire danger, which is we recognize it was completely different than staffing levels, so the, the, those are different elements total in, in totality. Um, Zeke, do you have the, there we go. As it came to, uh, as Zeke already a bit uh, referred to National Fire Danger Rating System uh, rate points, uh, what we did in Wisconsin was we uh, put all the fuel models for all the stations at fuel model Q. And uh, if you were to surface over any one of those, you'd see fuel model Q as the standard. So we thought it was uh, imperative that you could compare apples to apples across the state. Um, and then you could see uh, what those breakpoints were as it related to fire danger using the BI component. Now you can, you know, this one is, is looking at BI, um, but obviously you can do ERC or um, ignition component. Um, and spread component as well, but those were where the breakpoints were, and um, in the top left there, you can see where it says uh, fuel model Q colors. I mean, you can click the color component off if you want, and just see the values if it is if it's associated there. So you certainly have that, but you know, one word of caution when you're looking at this: this was basically used uh, and developed for Wisconsin using fuel model Q. Now, other stations across the uh, Great Lakes, maybe using their first fuel model in WIMS may be a different model. So, you know, they might be using an H or um, L or something to that effect, which, you know, to do a comparison um, and the value points uh, will definitely be off. So um, it's always critical um, if you're not looking in Wisconsin to look at what those fuel models are and look at those components and breakpoints that would be established there. Is there any questions as it relates to, uh, you know, the fire danger and different agencies' perspectives on how they they establish those? I don't have any at the current time. Okay. Um, I guess as I would I would look at this, and uh, if there's any further questions as it relates to um, either one of the agencies, uh, certainly make contact for me for any issues in Wisconsin. Uh, Doug and uh, Don Johnson in Michigan, um, Doug from Minnesota. Uh, we could respond to any of those concerns or, or, or potentially tweak those issues if you see some, some variations that uh, don't seem right because uh, we're still in a, clearly in a developmental phase of, uh, you know, it's a living document. If, if we see things that need to be changed, we're certainly going to, you know, reestablish those breakpoints to better suit uh, the field expectations of what the conditions are, are really like in the field. So I think those are the things that um, we certainly would enjoy and uh, the feedback, um, how valuable this information is. Yep. Um, Jim, um, so are other federal agencies in Wisconsin also using the FMQ? A few model Q. Uh, they, all the, all the um, federal agency uh, weather stations have transferred or moved fuel model Q as they're in their first position. Now they they don't all staff or, or 
uh, establish their fire danger from that fuel model, uh, they were gracious to put that fuel model in front so we could do some comparisons statewide. Uh, they, they may uh, download through WIMS and actually look at a, a, a different fuel model, maybe ER or you know, L, to do their staffing or uh, develop their fire danger rating. But uh, you know, because you can actually catalog, I believe it's four, four different fuel models in WIMS so, so they can have room for uh, those other few models that they perhaps use. Okay. Thank you. That, that, unless there's questions, uh, th that would be all the information that I have available at this time. Okay. And, um, uh, I guess uh, I'll jump back in and say, Charles, that uh, uh, this uh, concludes the formal presentation, that uh, if there are other questions or comments, uh, we'd certainly entertain them, uh, and um, uh, we could, uh, uh, you know, continue if there uh, were specific questions. I hope that some folks had the opportunity to log on and uh, uh, to the system and were uh, following along with us, and uh, uh, that they will take time over the next few days and weeks to uh, get more familiar with the system. Sure. Certainly communicate with those three folks. Yeah, there, there is one question here, um, and I believe this goes back to um, the last part of your portion that you presented, Zeke. Um, so old profiles that were created in that system, will they transfer to the new site that's been developed? Uh, they do, uh, but I would urge folks to uh, uh, actually create new ones that the system has changed uh, pretty dramatically from last year. And uh, I'm not sure that there aren't some uh, uh, gremlins in those old profiles. So uh, last year, the system, uh, as it was different, it actually encouraged the use of multiple profiles. I think really the only profile that a user really needs to have uh, now is the one that identifies the area and the uh, radius for stations that they want to include. Uh, with that one profile set as a default, they can bring up the system as they want and then uh, uh, change it as they need uh, for a given situation. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience here? This is John. I just wanted to interject. Uh, one thing to be aware of is with the um, this computing facility located within the university, we are at the uh, whim of university IT folks. And so next Tuesday, March 22nd, this site will be down for maintenance from about 8 a.m. Central Daylight Time until early to late afternoon. And this happens about once every four to five months where it uh, is sort of pulled, the rug is pulled out from underneath us. So. Um, we will be posting that on the site, and we'll, one thing you'll want to be paying attention to is there is a link to a status information, and we'll use that as a way to also communicate if there are known problems. Uh, that's a great point, uh, John, and I think that, uh, that really anytime you have a system like that that depends on Internet connectivity, we've become so dependent on it and we become so confident in it that we don't always uh, prepare for Murphy. Uh, and I think it's uh, maybe something to think about, that if you notice that uh, warning, uh, and I'm hoping that John puts it up several days in advance, that you make preparations. And one of the things is, is that for your area of interest, it might be important to print out the, uh, uh, the, code, the current codes for the day before, so that if you need to uh, make a manual uh, calculation, it is possible to do that. Um, Zeke, we have another question that's come in. Um, so will the Michigan DNR be maintaining the fire weather site that you used to maintain? Is that going to continue on, um, especially with uh, the graphs of the Canadian codes? Uh, actually, uh, I, I, I think that direction, the question needs to be directed to Don Johnson. Uh, that uh, I, I think that this system was designed to provide all of the information that uh, was on that Michigan site and uh, more. Uh, so I would encourage folks that have been going there for weather information to uh, learn to go to this site. Okay, um, another question. So when you're looking at a forecast at 8 a.m. and planning for the day, 
um, what forecasted weather will be used? Uh, well, so uh, what you are, are looking at 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, the actual values will be for, uh, for the actual daily values that will be displayed will be from uh, midday yesterday. Uh, and uh, the forecast values will be for uh, midday today and midday tomorrow. Uh, the conditions uh, at that point in time, you will probably have uh, 12 to 14 hours of actual weather incorporated into that. And so if it has rained overnight, you will actually incorporate that actual rainfall. Uh, and then they will only be incorporating three or four hours of uh, forecasted rainfall into that uh, first day forecast. So really, uh, you're getting uh, as close to a now cast as possible uh, when you uh, come in at 8 o'clock in the morning and look at that forecast. Okay. Do we have any more questions from the audience this morning? I guess. Morning where you are, afternoon where I am here on the East Coast. Well, I really appreciate the, uh, the attendance. Uh, and um, uh, we, will, we did record this. We'll be uh, certainly communicating with the folks that registered. Uh, and um, uh, you know, we hope you uh, consider joining us for the one on April 7th. I'd like to thank Jim, John, and, and Zeke for their time and uh, very nice presentation today. And um, I think with that, we'll conclude the webinar today. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day, and uh, thank you for attending.